Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit this out because uh, uh, I'm working with the computer here. And also, as Barney suggested, uh, I won't be able to take any questions or interruptions during the flow because it literally does flow. And if I've if I, any interruption in the flow, and I'll not be able to get it up and running again. The title is Boulder Rock Art in the Quilka Region. Uh, important word there will be Boulder. I'll explain why I've added that to the rock art aspect of it. Quilka Region, I hope to uh, sh show what we mean by the Quilka Region. And the incomplete story is because as Barney suggested, we don't seem to have anything beyond the area that we were looking at, myself and Jim. This is based upon the project that myself and Jim uh, undertook over 25 years. Uh, and the area now is known as Quilka Sleeve and Erin Project. Uh, and that's me. I've done a lot of text on this because I want to reproduce this as a downloadable uh, presentation. So I'll let you read a lot of the text and sometimes I will uh, speak it out. But basically the structure of the presentation is sequential cumulative. I'll start with the basic rock art and then I'll go to more complex. Uh, I hope to introduce some new insights on the idea of the, the rock art is on boulders and the archaeologists tend to ignore the boulders that they're on. And I also hope to introduce a form of rock art that the archaeologists still don't know about. That, this, that's our book that myself and Jim produced. And it's available as a free download from the cavanburn.ie uh, website. Uh, and that's the website. And if you want to know about the website, it's up there later on. And there's a QR code on that. So uh, for those who don't know what a QR code is, you just take a photograph of it and if you've got a smartphone, it'll probably bring you straight to the link. If you don't have a smartphone, you may have to get an app to read the QR code and it'll give you the link. It saves you writing down the actual uh, website. And Ronan McManus is the lad that has done this. That's Ronan McManus of the Money Gashel Post Office. Of course, the work we were doing was in the Marble Arch Caves Global Geo Park, and this is the mountain, Quilka Mountain. And my apologies to the Slaven Erin end of it, uh, as I the, down to Bally Valley Gap. I don't have a photograph of that uh, part of the mountain, and in fact, uh, somebody has said, "Oh, is that the arch end of the mountain you're de dealing with?" Uh, and I says, you "Don't let, don't say that to them. Whatever you do." <laughs> oh, oh, what am I saying? <laughs> so, what is rock art? Many people, they get the image of animals on cave walls. Rock art in Ireland is nothing like that. There are two different types of rock art in Ireland. Megalithic rock art and Atlantic rock art. The megalithic rock art is found on passage tombs and is quite complex zigzags, shapes and so on, and spirals. So, megalithic rock art happens on stone buildings, passage tombs, and there are none in this area. The rock art in this area occurs on boulders out in the hills, and it's called Atlantic rock art, and it's mainly cups and rings in various combinations. So, it's called Atlantic rock art because it occurs mostly on the Atlantic fringe countries of Ireland, Britain, France, Spain, and so on. It's thought to range from the late Neolithic to the Bronze Age. Now, you'll find that the images I use are primarily based upon 3D images from the rock art. And one of the things I have done with the 3D is I've removed the uh, natural colours. Because the natural colours, if you take a photograph or go to a rock art boulder, you'll not see it unless you've got special lighting conditions. Whereas if you remove the colour of the 3D, you can actually see the shadows and the shapes of the features. So most of my rock art illustrations will be uh, basically 3D without the colour. I'm going to compare the two. Megalithic rock art, as I said, is done on tombs, inside, both inside and outside. Whereas the Atlantic rock art is done on the boulders in the hills. 
megalithic rock art is said as Neolithic. Atlantic rock art is mainly Bronze Age and late Neolithic. Megalithic rock art is more complex, being made up of the various geometric shapes. Whereas Atlantic rock art is predominantly cups and rings in various combinations, like that. Now, I'm going to rush through most of this stuff here. You're not going to have time to study these, but I will be producing a full uh, presentation, video, quick time video for this presentation, and I'll also produce, to go with it, a PDF, so you'll be able to have a high quality images of everything that we produce here. Or better still, it's all in the book. I hope I don't say that too often. <laughs> <laughs> but here's something that's not in the book. Uh, we had a visitor from Kerry, Avine Lamb, recently. And she has produced quite a lot of information about rock art. In fact, there are no publications on rock art in Ireland. The only rock art book that's been published in Ireland has been in Wexford by Chris Corlett, and it was basically a catalogue. There is no other booklet or book on the whole of Ireland uh, rock art. There are loads of uh, uh, articles and bits and pieces in various journals, but uh, Avian is bringing the whole lot together. So those are the basic motifs. Now I'm going to use uh, two new words for you: motifs. Okay, that's just the, the, the sort of uh, the symbols. Uh, they are combined into compositions on panels. That's the rock face, and that is another level of understanding. They can occur as single cups, multiple cups, or patterns of cups in alignments, geometric arrangements, astronomical layouts, as maps, and so on. So you can have quite a, from a very basic uh, cup and ring, you can have very, very complex uh, panels. And the range is endless, and the interpretations are infinite. And we'll not know what it means unless we get the Rosetta Stone of rock art. Now, I know that the first question I will be asked when we get the question and answer series will be, well, what do they mean? Or what do you think they mean? I don't care what they mean. I don't know what they mean. And anybody tells you otherwise or uh, chance in their arm. They don't know. We don't know. We'll never know. <coughs> so, Avine, uh, that's you'll see her up there again. That's her uh, Kerry Rock Art uh, Facebook page, and that's the QR code for it, and that'll be printed in the PDF, so you can use that. And that, that is, that's the Kerry Archaeological Historic Society that she's been writing on. She's produced a map in that publication of all the rock art in Ireland. And she started out with 1972, Elizabeth Shee, who is now Elizabeth Shee Tuhig, and she did her own one for 2022. And you can see from the uh, 1972 one, uh, this area has three examples in the whole of Fermanagh, or maybe four if you include that uh, border between Fermanagh and Tyrone at the time. Whereas Avian has been able to produce a, a more detailed uh, and more comprehensive map of all the rock art in Ireland. And she includes our little area here. And that's our little northwest. Of, of Ireland, and we've got Cavan and Leitrim uh, alongside Fermanagh. And at this stage, you almost immediately see that there is one set, uh, little area within Cavan, and absolutely nothing, well, sorry, one also in Leitrim, but basically, you have a very blank area uh, for, for Leitrim and Cavan, and that's what I mean by the incomplete story. And this is ourselves in this area. So how much rock art is there in this area? But then, what is this area? So we'll t take a look at what the area is. Myself and Jim did mostly the Burren and the foothills of Quilca, and basically that, the pla that plateau that is the foothills of Quilca Mountain. And that is what I'm basing this talk on. I am not making any attempt to cover 
they uh, down to Stephen Aaron, uh, even though, of course, there is nothing to cover in regard to rock art anyway. <coughs> so basically, this is the area that we're going to be looking at, Cavan Leitrim and uh, Quilca. And the places Black Lion, Glen Farn, Glen Gevlin, Dara, Swollen Bar, Drum Kieran, Drum Shambo, Arigna, and then the mountains of Quilca, Playbank, Sleeve and Aaron, Ben Croy, and Ben Brack. And Loch Allen, of course, is a very important part of this whole uh, area. So that's basically our little area that we, we, that we think you will be looking at and be interested in uh, walking the hills and paddling the lakes. I'll also include uh, Glenfarn and Terra Mountain. Now, just to emphasize again, myself and Jim did most of our work in that little area, so I don't know anything else or anything about anywhere else other than that. So I'm uh, very limited in what I can talk about and where I can talk about. The Rayfad is up in Bow. It was the only one recorded uh, a few years ago, along with Killikeen in the Marl Bank. And this was Killikeen in the Marl Bank, and it was the only example recorded. This is an example again of the 3D, which helps to show the shadows and shapes. And you can see there are lovely cups and rings uh, on that 3D. This is another one in uh, the burn, and it's a good example of a double cup and ring. And the 3D again helps you to see the shadows and the shapes, and is similar to what we've just been looking at in Kilikihan. Kilikihan, by the way, is in the Marl Bank. I will also emphasize at this stage, I am not going to attempt to do a comprehensive location mapping and showing you where all, all these things are, because it's way beyond the scope of this talk. I'm going to give you a few classic examples, a few representative examples, but the other hundred are all in the book, okay? <laughs> We did get published in 2007, uh, in the, and we made the front page of Archaeology Ireland, and we also got the centre sp uh, spread for the rock art at, in 2007, and that was at a very early stage of our discoveries. Okay. Uh, here's an example now in Legna Brocky, which is on the Geopark uh, Quilka Walk, and again, this one here is a good example of no rings, and it's just got cups, and there's no particular pattern or uh, shape to them. They just seem to be randomly scattered. However, they may not be, and we may never know what they mean. You've also got another one, like Lebrocki, right beside it. And it's a lovely shaped one. And unlike the previous one, this is on the rounded top and sides of the boulder, uh, on the south-facing side of the boulder. And another one that we have is in the Kilikehan Nature Reserve. And it well, used to be shown as a, a boulder monument, or sorry, a, bo a glacial erratic, and had a signpost. Now there's no signpost. None of those uh, uh, three have any signage of any sort uh, on them. In fact, the, if you asked any member of the Geopark staff, they wouldn't know where they are or what they are. And uh, obviously, as far as I'm concerned, don't care about them either. And I'll explain why I, I make that accusation. <laughs> because if they cared, they would uh, include them in their uh, educational stuff. So that's the three together. Legna Brocky Rock Art and uh, that, that one there in Kilikihil. So we've seen the cups and cups and rings. Now we see another form uh, a pattern called a rosette. It's like the petals on a rose. And this is one that Jim found, of course, I uh, might, might as well say that they all have been found by Jim, because nearly always I would be uh, recording the, the one he's just found, and then he'd say, okay, but here's another one, here's another one. Wait, Jim, did I get this one finished first? So Jim kept on finding most of the stuff. Uh, and it's a beautiful uh, rosette uh, thing. Even tells me that rosettes are quite rare, and this area is the greatest concentration in Ireland. In fact, you'll see nearly 
all of the examples I give will show rosettes. Now, we're going to take a look at a boulder with a load of these on it, and this is in Tlayana, up in the Marl Bank. And when I started out, this is what I used. I used the uh, crayons on the boulder, and I would do a crayon rubbing. Now, it's generally uh, regarded as not the proper thing to do, because you may actually uh, be uh, rubbing on the boulder. It may not be good for, for the boulder. But that was the technique I used originally. And this, by the way, was found by Julie Stevenson. And it has three rosettes and a cup and ring. And they, there are uh, stonemason cuts, that, some stonemason that started working on it and had stopped, obviously having, having realised that he was interfering with uh, ancient work. And rock art can be a great inspiring educational tool. And when I worked at God at all, that was one of my favourite activities, would be to take the, the young people up and say, look, this is what they were writing and drawing uh, thousands of years ago. And you know, it is fascinating to be able to see uh, that what they, those people had written and drawn at the time. And I say written because it could be an alphabet. Now again, 3D shows the rock art best. And you can see the patterns there uh, fairly easily with the shadows. Now we're going to take a look at another one. And what we started out with was nice, simple, straightforward uh, cups and uh, rings. And now we're moving on to more complex examples. And this is again one that Jim found. Now this particular one has been shaped and uh, repositioned in order to catch the light. And the 3D will show fairly well the rosettes. Now I will show you a, a hand-drawn uh, interpretation of that there, even if, if you can't spot everything on it at the moment. So sometimes you do need to have it uh, extracted and drawn. So sometimes a, a line drawing is better than the 3D, ironically, because you can then see exactly what's on the, the boulder. And this is, we're going to compare this one with the one we were looking at previously in Tliana. This, by the way, 709, is in the burn and is well signposted. And it's amazingly similar to the one in the World Bank at Tliana. Now this is it with myself and Jim in those good old days when we used to be able to get out and Jim was able to uh, use his hands. Uh, what I'm highlighting here is that there is an incision around the edges of these. Uh, most archaeologists, in fact archaeologists in general, would not see this and wouldn't understand it because it is a form of rock art that is very common now in this area. Uh, and it's an additional, it's an embellishment of the rock art that rock archaeologists have not yet been able to identify and recognise. Now, this is a special boulder monument. And what I'm adding here now is an extra dimension, and we're looking at the boulders that are being used and the landscape that it's... Uh, placed in. So the archaeologists have looked at the motifs only. So to me, the, the, the archaeologists looking at only the motifs and ignoring the boulder is like the 19th century archaeologists who excavated sites and threw away everything except what they found. Today every learned piece of dirt contains essential information. To the archaeologists, boulders are just that sort of dirt and their broken pieces alongside are definitely not relevant. However, in this area nearly every boulder with rock art has been deliberately manipulated in some way. In fact, the pieces that are lying alongside can indicate that they have been uh, taken off, ch changed and moved and broken and exposed in order for the rock art to take place. And this is where the archaeologists are missing out on this 
Uh, the, as far as they're concerned, it's the rock art they're looking at only. They don't understand the boulder. So rock art boulders should be investigated as boulder monuments. So if you were out there, what would you do? Well, for example, you might ask, uh, has the boulder surface been prepared? Has it been chosen due to its position? Or has it been repositioned? Has it been cho chosen due to any special properties of the boulder rock type? Or because of the, it's, it's the shape of the boulder? Or what other, uh, what other monuments are nearby? For example, both the Rayfad and Kleiner rock art boulders have been shown to be originally positioned horizontally on a pedestal and only relatively, relatively recently have been toppled to lie at an angle. Uh, and none of the uh, archaeological state, state monument record information uh, spots that, as far as they're concerned, these boulders and this rock art is positioned in situ. Whereas, in fact, it, it, it can be very easily demonstrated that they have been toppled off the thing. And they were toppled by the stonemasons to, to get, get at them, to hammer them. And when they, they, these would have been in the horizontal position, the cup patterns may have had alignment significance. And the 709 one we were looking at there is, uh, appears to be deliberately at an angle to catch the sunlight at certain times of the day on particular dates. So again, looking at how the boulder has been positioned and repositioned and chosen uh, is, is an important part of the rock art study. Agate rock, rock art, we discovered it, and I discovered it in 1998. Uh, it is on the state monument record. So I'm going to introduce complex boulder mon monument manipulation and how rock art and sculptings are brought together. I'll explain sculptings later on. This is my very first attempt at recording the rock art. There it is. Could we have a light there for 30 seconds? That's the crane rubbing for that particular boulder. And it gives you an idea of the, the scale and the size of the thing. OK, thanks, Barney. Three D is now much better, and it is non intrusive. So, we, we myself and Jim noticed that there was a pedestal there, and we worked out that uh, the pieces that are in place at the moment was originally a single boulder on that pedestal, and this is something that myself and Jim have been doing religiously. Excuse the term. Uh, we've been looking at every single boulder and how it was positioned on the limestone pedestals. So that's a study in itself, and that's why we can immediately spot when things have been moved, because we can always spot the original pedestal and how the boulder has been moved. This particular one, not only had it been moved off the pedestal, but it had been split, and the split section had been repositioned. And the rock art done on the repositioned face. And that face, by the way, is what we call a fresh face, because when the boulder was split, you ended up with a, a brand new fresh face to work on, a new canvas. Uh, we also noted on a revisit to it there, uh, we noticed that it has a, not only a unique composition of cups and rings, but it also has what we call sculptings, rim grooving sculptings. In, on that corner. And that was a really important realisation because here we had a boulder which had been split, a fresh face been created, for, a fresh canvas to work on, rock art had been done it, <coughs> on it, and also at the same time most likely this rim grooving sculptings which we've been identifying has been done it. And the significance of that is that it's almost definitely contemporaneous with the rock art. So with this suggests uh, that sculptings could very well, rather than predating or post-dating, it could very well be part of the rock art uh, the system uh, at the time. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to ver verify these 
as anthropogenic by comparing the split sections. And what we mean by splitting, <coughs> excuse me, comparing the split sections, I, I can manipulate the 3D uh, bits and reposition them. And what's really important is when you get them together, you find there are gaps. And where there are gaps, that tells you pieces have been removed. And you can work out that there has been work done, and you can work out what has been removed. <coughs> and th this is an example just of the refitting. And again, you can't tell much by looking at that there, but that's the refitting. And it's an important tool to bring together the broken pieces that are laying around and put them together and show what, how the boulder originally was. We also noted that the other slab was also worked, and we had assumed it had been just left lying there. And a corner hollow with rim grooving is very clearly uh, uh, obvious on it. So to sum up, that particular boulder, Agadirik boulder, has been monument features that archaeologists would invariably ignore or miss. Original boulder was on a pedestal, it was split, one section moved and rock art added. Rim grooving is on this section and also on the other discarded section. Very close by, there is another boulder with cup marks. And finally, the whole complex is located in a site with settlement wall features disappearing under bog. Archaeologists would only see the rock art and would ignore or miss the rest. And in case they get been unfair in them, they did miss all of those features. There is a state monument record and there's absolutely nothing about any of the context in the state monument record. And the same for Kliana. Now, Agatha Rook sets the theme for this presentation. The rock art is only part of complex boulder monument building. Now, this is another, in, another one in uh, the Burham. It's uh, PB23, and that's because we originally discovered it as a post, uh, pedestal boulder, and it was number 23, one of uh, dozens that we were finding at the time because it was propped, but we later on found rock art on it. The rock art slab is a flat, fresh face, the original position of the two slabs with the slab on top and then the slab was removed and repositioned and the, when it was repositioned a prop was inserted 3D shows how the two slabs were originally positioned and again, the detail of this will miss you by at the moment. I'm just to show you that this is what, what I was doing and I was able to study and find the missing pieces. And I, I don't mind it say, suggesting that this is a groundbreaking analysis program. And I could suggest that this technique has not been used in this way by any other researchers in Ireland or the UK, primarily because they haven't been finding rock art on broken pieces of boulders. Most rock art in uh, Britain and Ireland is on boulders out in the fields with no evidence of how the boulder got there and nobody's ever looked to see is the other half there or whatever. So okay, I, I, this is, uh, I'm trying to suggest that when you're out there you don't just look at the rock art, you look at the boulders and the surround. Now this is just an example of the 3D you may notice I've got the colour and texture of the boulder in its natural colours. And you can see most of the features, but when I remove the colour, I think it makes it just that wee bit easier to see the motifs. And you can see a circle around the uh, inner, there's a cup and ring and there's an outer ring on that. And this is my very first attempt at recording the, this here and I used chalk, not acceptable nowadays but that's what we did at the time and uh, I was able to produce a thing and uh, you, producing the aerial photograph meant putting the, uh, the, uh, the camera on a time lapse on a big long pole. Now this has got to be very quick because I'm already running behind schedule. So you, you may have downloaded further information from the book. Now this is a very quick introduction to boulder monuments. The removal of slab. Uh, re removal of pedestal. Uh, 
side of the boner removed. A, a, ch a, a chalk stone inserted. We call them prop stones. Dr. David Shepherd has produced a, 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 an article in Time and Mind. And this is an example of a prop boulder and curb wall, curbs. So basically, what we have are seven different forms of uh, boulder monuments. Okay? Now, th that uh, is covered nicely in the book, so I, that's why I rushed through it. I need to get moving on. But I am going to show you a few classic examples of a prop boulder. This is a repositioned boulder. This is a beautifully propped boulder, which I use as icon for the book. There's another example of a prop boulder and a limestone uh, chuck propping it and a, a stone behind propping the boulder. There's another beautifully propped boulder. And this is a really unique one with uh, sh uh, the prop as a, on the sharp axis. Now we're going to take a wee break and we'll look at an, an area, not, on, not rock art area. And here I am in Dara talking about Glengevlin. I don't know much about Dara, but I don't need to talk about Dara as it's all very well researched by the book Fire on the Mountain by the St. Hughes Primary School here in Dara. An excellent publication which I thoroughly recommend. Okay? So I don't need to talk about Dara because it's covered in the book. Okay? Fire on the Mountain. But I will talk about Glengevlin. If you look at most of the <coughs> the geopark panels, uh, they do not include Glengevlin as a geopark site. Some of them do, some of them don't. It, it's definitely not listed. It's been forgotten about. And this is why I want to bring it back to the attention of the, the geopark and people that it is so, uh, a neglected and lost uh, site. Glengevlin. There's a Sean Eamon Ruri trail that myself and Jim helped to produce in uh, the year, the, year, in the year 2000. We, I visited there a few weeks ago with Magda and Alistair and uh, the sculpture is intact and in place. Uh, there, there's a sweat house there as well, Legna Grow. Uh, it's, it really adds, you've got so many features in that one little area that's well worth going, but if you do want to see a sweat house, uh, go to the one at Monegashel because it's much handier to see. Now, I mentioned sweat houses, and I think it's very important that, 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 that you see the amount of sweat houses in this area. This is a, a, a map produced in the Atlas of the Irish Rural Landscape. And in it, they say that they occur chiefly in the northern half of the island with a major concentration in the counties Leitrim, Fermanagh, and Cavan. This area around Loch Allen and between uh, Lenfarn and Dara. It, uh, it shows that this is the most, in fact, it's the only map of rock, or of, uh, sorry, sweat houses in Ireland shown in this book. Uh, unfortunately, the reference section doesn't include the source for this unique bit of research. The book was published in 1986, and there hasn't been any published work on sweat houses since then. However, I can now reveal the source, should anybody wish to follow this up. Sweat houses are, by the way, beyond the scope of this talk, so this is very brief. If we look and zoom into this particular uh, map and look at it very, very closely, we can actually see that it is a, a copy of a map that was produced in 1992. By me. <laughs> uh, I, I produced detailed records of over a hundred boulder or sweat houses in Leitrim. The whole way down along Loch Allen, Dara area, you know, the, the Lenfarn. I visited every single site. This is the most comprehensive survey ever of sweat houses in this area and included the Ordnance Survey maps from the 1880s and involved visits to each particular site. The important thing was that I not only found the ones that were intact, or the ones in ruins, but I also checked if the original site was uh, where there was a 
the, the particular ones originally recorded and mapped. <coughs> so I recorded those. There is a survey at the moment, and they're only seeking good intact examples. And that survey, and by the way, you can download the PDF from cavernburn.ie on the sweat houses. And this is the Leitrim Sweat House project, which was running in 2021, Monster Archaeology, unaware of the survey work by me. Several sites were found that thought was previously unrecorded until they saw my, my survey. It has been continued in 2022. Hopefully it will make use of the original survey. Uh, they may only want to look at intact things, but I think it's very important that every person in every town land where there used to be a sweat house, that they should be aware of it. That, I mean, how th this sort of information is uh, not been uh, taken on. I blame myself to a certain extent, but I also blame the Leitrim and Calvin Council for not t taking up. I published it in, uh, K K K K sorry, in Kalina, sorry, Kalesher's uh, book and in Belku Klinish book and uh, Ulster uh, folk life as well. So it was published and it was available. And the fact that the rural landscape people were able to find it uh, meant that it wasn't all that hard to find. So back to the, the Sean Eamon Rory tree. We're going to take a look at an, an abandoned road that is at least a thousand years old. I'm not going to go into the detail on this, but I just want to point out one particular feature on this particular road, and it is stepping stones across the River Shannon. <coughs> and we revisited this recently. It was 20 years since I'd been there. And these are incredible stepping stones. That's Alistair walking across the stepping stones, and that's the, the dimensions of them. And this is a 3D scan showing the early view of the overview of the stones, which is slightly better than a drone because it, you can remove the vegetation. And I also was able to do uh, an iPad LiDAR scan to get the dimensions. And so you're able to get detailed me measurements from the LiDAR scan. So conclusion, this is an amazing, unique feature that needs further study and should be un included in the Calvin Way. Back to rock art and boulders. Now I'm running short on time. Frank White and Tower Mountain Glen Farm. Very quick mention of uh, the work that Frank has been doing there. Tower Mountain. Hundreds of uh, boulder monuments. Uh, there's just to give you an example of the number of ones. Uh, again, you see this in the book. And these are some examples and they really are spectacular, and there's also sculptings on many of them. And this is a good example of a sculpting uh, feature. <coughs> it's hard to believe that that has been done by human beings. It is just absolutely spectacular, and there's only one of dozens of sculptures in sculptings in, in that area. We also uh, did the equinox alignments and one incredible example was where the sun shines between a spit boulder and shines on the back of a back stone and there you can see where the sun on the equinox only. Quilka Mountain itself has uh, loads of boulder monuments, Alistair and Magda both have discovered those hundreds, over a hundred of them on the top of Quilca. I will mention that the, it is on, uh, the, the light, sorry, the geology is quite important when you're doing the study of this uh, to understand the different types of uh, uh, sandstone and shale and bedrock that where these erratics ar arrive and come from. But that's a study in itself. And these are just more examples of these wonderful boulder monuments that can be seen on Quilca Mountain. So sculptings are a newly f discovered form of rock art. Traditional rock, the regular shapes. Sculptings are excavated from the natural aspects of a boulder and predetermined by the type of by the boulder and the natural topo topography there. That is rim grooving and a corner hollow with rim grooving. How do we t tell the difference between a hollow and a cup? Cups tend to be circular and almost hemispherical. 
hollows tend to have irregular outlines and variable depths. And you can compare them there in the right light. You can see that they are very convincing. Here are the two complex uh, sculptings. And just to wherever we this is the that's the real life thing. And the important bit is that are, it's a split boulder and that's the original section coming off it. So what's underneath that has been cut out. See that? Mm -hmm. And that proves that it's anthropogenic, it, that it has been done by human beings. And the, the features that they, they both demonstrate is a notch and a peak and a notch and a peak and channels. Again, I can't go into detail on this. This is just a very, very quick introduction to sculptings. Giant sleep rock art. And this is a roughly the rock art in the area that I was talking about. And just to mention that there have been recent discoveries by Magda in Court McConnell, and they have also got uh, rosettes. Of course, the Calvin Byron Park was where myself and Jim most, did most of the stuff. Just to, to show how we determined the area we were working in, is we t took into account the mountain, which was sandstone, the lower li limestone, and it was the limestone uh, plateau that we found most of the glacial erratics and the, what we have found. This is a very, very quick example of the range of boulder monuments in the Burren and the different classifications and the number of them in that little area. Again, this is all in the book, so I'm not making any attempt to explain what, what I've got here. It's much too complex to deal with in a short uh, thing here. I also just want to mention that practically all of our rock art and all of our boulder monuments are in the context in, in the Burren of settlement features, a little village. Okay? And the boulder monuments are actually incorporated into the prehistoric walls. On, on, of the hot sites. So, uh, to sum up what we, myself and Jim found, at 30 kilometres of uh, Radic Wall, 150 rock, sorry, houses, rock art, new monument types, new form of rock art, we set the standard, survey became evidence building and human versus natural, and it was identified as Bronze Age. Does this include shaping a boulder by cutting away sections? They didn't draw animals, but what if they were drawing hills and mountains, not with lines, but with the boulder shapes? <coughs> Recently, we were on Quilka Mountain Park, and Danny, Danny noticed this. A split boulder had a section cut away to exactly resemble Quilka Gap. There is the bit cut away, Quilka Gap, from the Quilka Mountain Park walk. There is Quilka Gap, familiar to many. There is the shape. And when you compare the shapes, almost identical, three aspects of this work shows it cannot be natural coincidence. The vertical and horizontal proportions plus the angles of the two sides are a near perfect match. So that is where they have been recreating the mountain. Other examples of mountain has been sculpted. This is a sculpture, a sculpting in the Burren, and that's the sculpting, and there's Quilka Mountain. That is the, that is Quilka Mountain. Okay. And this is another one, which when you compare the, the shape of it with 
the Google map and uncannily similar. I'll run that again, just to see what I mean. That's the sculpting. That's Google Maps, and that's Quilkin Mountain. Now we're going to move on to look at a particular <coughs> strange example called PB48. Beautifully shaped boulder with the sculpting features. And th this is us comparing them. That's what it looks like in real life. Okay. And we can show that that, that was done. I'm going to move on from this one here. I'm not going to bother with that. I just showed that it was a split boulder and the bits and pieces were brought together. Now, I can't get it this to scroll for some reason. Sorry, I'm not using my own computer, and I can't scroll down. I'm trying to skip things and move on. This is just a small mention that it, shape boulders are significant, because we can, we can show that this boulder has had sections removed to create its shape. And now, this is the, the final and uh, most spectacular one we left to last, and it's the boat in the cabin, Burren Park. Now, this is a very easy to view in the car park, but it's very hard to see in light. In fact, it's very, very difficult to see, and this is the only way you will get to see it, is to use a powerful light. I even also found a rosette beside this. This is just a 3D of that particular boulder, and to be honest with you, I think the best thing you can do if you're visiting this boulder is to take your uh, smartphone with you with the uh, cabinburn.ie uh, 3D and play the 3D at the same time. And you can see the wonderful shapes on that and the shadows you, you can create by using the 3D. And I have produced a uh, a, a way of drawing these, uh, to draw sculptings was more difficult than rock art because of the, the, the voids and shapes and, and so on. So I had to develop a special technique for drawing them. But this particular one is in the car park in Calvin Burren. Uh, the Geo Park don't know about it, uh, are not interested in it. Uh, I've tried to get them to, to take an interest. There's nothing to indicate it. I have put a QR codes, uh, little discrete ones beside there, so people can look it up. Um, but to me, when you consider that, to me that is art. That's not just a cup and ring. And you can probably see things that you shouldn't see. <laughs> 